5.30 for work, you end up on the cotton rope or the cotton field. They call it a rope. As far as the eye can see, nothing but white. We will wake up at 5.30. We will be on the cotton roll by 6.30. We will pick cotton from 6.30 a.m. to right around 11 or 11.30. Come in to eat, take an hour break, and we will be back on the cotton field in 80, 90 degree weather by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And we will pick cotton from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Two halves, Monday through Friday. We picked a whole lot of cotton. Whole lot of cotton. So when you saw when you saw them saying, "Oh, y'all gonna be picking some cotton," what was the first reaction most most black people had? No, I'm gonna tell you. Now I've been the I've been in the streets. I've been in jail. Nobody even told me about the cotton. I thought it was a secret. I was as shocked as you are shocked right now. While while we cut these 28 acres, we don't see the other 3,000 acres of cotton. Field. Right? These are big acreages. These are farms. These are real plantations. These are plantations with acreages. This is not no garden in the back. Right? So while we are cutting grass, 28 acres, and on another 300,000 um, acres, I mean, 3,000 3, acres, they have planted fruits, vegetables, and cotton to be picked because they make money off this labor. This is free labor, Phil. They make money off this free labor. So once they planted it, we will pick it. It bloomed in September. It bloomed in September and October. When I went to the cotton fields, I had a breakdown. I had a mental breakdown. I mean, it really sunk in to me that this was slavery, that I'm finna pick cotton, right? And, of course, I would do the same thing you would do right now today, same thing as your viewers would do. I resist it. I was like, hey, man, I didn't cut grass. That was fine. But I'm not picking no cotton. I, I ain't no cotton picking, you know, Negro. I'm not doing that. They had a plan for me. They had a plan for me. <laughs> I thought I wasn't a cotton picking Negro. They made me one. And how did they do that? Well, they have perfected a system for over 400 years of mentally, physically, and spiritually breaking black man in America, right? And it's like, well, how can they do that? Did they whip me? No, they had no whips. They had graduated from whips. They had no whips. They did have guns to keep, make sure that this structure is in control. If you got too wild, you just got shot and killed. Now, the first law of nature is survival, right? So you're definitely not going to take the door that's going to kill you, right? No matter how tough you are, you're not walking through door that's going to kill you. You're going to explore the other doors. So they will kill you if you got too out of control. So in my experience, I refused to pick cotton. I raised the fuss and they surrounded me. Now, in the fields when we are working, the overseer, right, which is the guards, they ride horses. We on the ground, they on horses. Um, each crew of 19 has an overseer that's on the horse overseeing this project, right? Overseeing their labor, okay? Also, they have a high rider, right? So you got 19 men on horses plus one. The high rider, he rides the high ground in case he has to shoot somebody trying to escape or acting bad. He has a rifle to gun you down from a distance. And they called him a high rider. If someone acts up like me, if someone behaves, threatens this system, you are surrounded by these men on horses instructed to get on on your on the, on your knees. Get on your knees. And one of them will get off the horse to handcuff you. If you make any moves, anything other than sit on your knees, you were shot and killed. Because you are a threat. The minute that man is off that horse, you are a threat to this system. And they have the right to murder you. So they handcuffed me. Got on my knees, they handcuffed me. I thought I was doing something, you know, bad, courageous. I thought I was standing up for myself. I thought I was being very dignified by letting them know I wasn't going to pick their cotton. And they had a plan for me. They handcuffed me. They put me on the back of a small little truck and drove me to what they call a Cadillac, Phil. A Cadillac is not a car, Phil. <laughs> a Cadillac is a 
flatbed trailer that's enclosed with regular gate metal fencing, right? Regular gate metal fencing that anybody has in their backyard, around a tennis court, around anything. I was I was driven to the middle of the field work to a Cadillac, which is a trailer enclosed with a metal fence. And I was put in that trailer with no seat, no nothing, in the middle of the day, handcuffed behind my back. And that's where I would remain until it was time for everybody to go in. So what was that experience inside that metal uh, the Cadillac? Man, it's the hot box. Can you imagine being outside in the sun right now with your clothes on and your hands behind your back and you can't move, sweat beating down your face, your shoulders like blocking up, tightening up. I mean, you're in an awkward position and you handcuffed and it's a cage with no shade, no seats. There's no getting comfortable. You're burning up and you, your body is aching. They don't need a whip. They use the sun and handcuffs. This is what they use to mentally get me to understand that, man, you know what? Picking cotton is better than being in this cage. Okay, you got one door you can go through, you could die. You got another door you can go through and sitting in the Cadillac. And then you got the third door, pick cotton. A lot of men chose the second door and came out of that door and went through that third door and picked cotton. That's how this environment is. That's how this environment is controlled. So for people that's thinking they won't go, they, they not going to do it, you're going to burn up in the sun or you're going to die. And people have died. In the Cadillac. In prison, period. People have died in the Cadillac. People have died trying to escape. People have, I mean, just think of the health conditions a person may have. Yeah. Listen, nobody, none of those 19 men on those horses, none of those white boys are nurses. None of them are medical, uh, equipped at all in the medical field. Probably all 19 of them had a GED. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I've been out there and I don't win this brother scream out the blue that they can't see. This so is what I'm telling you. I've seen brothers suffer heat strokes and lose their vision out there. Pass out. All right, let's talk about those guards. So those guards, how how were they? Because in my mind, you mentioned the overseers. So I'm thinking straight white supremacist type type cats. Right. Like, how often were y'all called the N-word out there? Oh, man, we was called the N-word all the time. We was called... All kind of words, man. I mean, words. I, you know, I'm a person from the streets. I didn't hear it all kind of in it, but I've never been called a goat smelling in word. Wow. <laughs> do you, do you, do you, listen, I never heard those words put together, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, I've been called a goat smelling in word. And as it relates to the um, ethnicity of the guards, right? It was majority white. They did have black, they did have Hispanic. But even now, when I look at it, you know, I feel like those brothers was coons that worked out there. I had no respect for those brothers when I when I was young, but then I realized they just a part of the same system, the same system of poverty that we are trying to get out of. They are coming up here in a racist environment to work, to try to get ahead. Right? And I had the privilege of asking some of them.